So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ivo Siegmann. Welcome to the penultimate talk in the Northwest Seminar Series of Mathematical Biology and Data Science this year. The seminar series is co-organized by the University of Liverpool, the University of Manchester, and Liverpool John Moores University. Today's seminar is hosted by Liverpool John Moores University and will be presented by Dr. Julia Brettschneider from the University of Warwick. Before I introduce Julia, I would like to announce our last talk. So if there's a penultimate talk, there will also be a last talk, of course. And um, that will be next week on Wednesday at the same time, Dr. Ria Antonio Corugnotti. Uh, and Ria will, in fact, physically travel to Liverpool and she will present her talk at the mathematics department of the University of Liverpool. I assume that it will also be possible to attend the talk uh, online, but um, yeah. Uh, stay tuned. Um, the colleagues in Liverpool will um, send out an invitation soon, I assume. I would now like to introduce uh, today's speaker. Julia Brettschneider studied mathematics in the city of Bonn, and I think at that time Bonn had just stopped being the capital of West Germany, because Germany had been uh, reunified, and um, for her PhD, she then moved to the Humboldt University in Berlin, which was the capital of Germany at that time, I think. And um, you did then your PhD with Hans Vollmer in 2001, um, as far as I found out. After um, your PhD, you spent a short time in Eurandom um, at, in the Netherlands, um, but then you moved um, to the Neyman Visiting Assistant Professorship in Berkeley. And um, I mentioned this because, in fact, we had one of your successors um, last year. So Merle Beer um, did the same thing, um, yeah, probably many years after you left Berkeley. And she um, spoke in our seminar uh, probably last year at this time. So I think your next stop was then uh, Canada. And after two years as an assistant professor at Queen's University, you finally arrived here in the UK um, in Warwick in 2007, and yeah, now you are a, an associate professor there. I look forward to your talk, um, Non-Parametric Methods for Point Pattern Analysis in Microscopic Images of Protein Abundance and um, Other Applications. Thank you so much for this amazing uh, yeah, introduction uh, and well done for, for tracing my movements. And uh, so today I, want to talk about uh, some work I did jointly with a colleague, Adam Johansson, and a PhD student, Tom Honor. Tom is now at UCL, um, and I think we're still, uh, still working uh, a bit more on this topic, as well as uh, I'm currently developing some related projects, uh, also using microscopic data with other data sources. So this is uh, still ongoing work, but I'm going to talk about mostly the work we did with Tom. Uh, and I want to start, uh, you know, since we are two Germans, at least here in the audience, I, st I thought I'd, I'd start with uh, a quote by uh, David Hilbert, who, um, who thought a bit at some point, he's a pure mathematician, as we all know, um, but he actually thought about applications in a certain context when he gave a, a speech on the radio and he came up with this metaphor of mathematics as a bridge between theory and applications. So I thought that was quite beautiful. Um, and you can hear the whole speech in original or you can read an English translation. And that was a time where science um, and including also mathematics, were not quite as prestigious as the humanities. So uh, it came out of a position where Hilbert wanted to communicate to everybody how important mathematics is from a theoretical point of view to, to, uh, to mediate the, so he, he says it's an instrument that mediates between theory and practice. And now I'm going to jump to some other quotes uh, as part of a two slide preamble before we get to actually work on the topic. Um, that, that also guide me a lot in the work to actually implement what, what Hilbert said, uh, that we want to use mathematics and statistics. So statistics being now as part of the wider 
the wider area of this. Um, and that is by two statisticians. So there is John Tukey's quote that I really like, um, far better an approximate uh, answer to the right question, which is often vague, than the exact answer to the wrong question, which can always be made more precise. So I think that is something really important to learn when we switch from doing proofs and theorems in a theoretical context to working with applications. Because we tend to be, when we come from pure mathematics, we tend to be very focused on getting the exact right perfect theorem. But maybe it's rather useless for the scientists we work with. So that is something I had to pick up on the way that it is just very important to ask the right question. Another important quote is by uh, George Box. All models are wrong, some are useful. Again, uh, it shifts our attention from the natural obsession we have in mathematics to say everything, uh, uh, to, to focus on correctness, which is of course also important. We are not saying we should do all things wrong, but it's, it's, uh, it's not the only thing that is important. So um, with these things in mind, let's uh, start with the actual talk today. Um, I want to talk about a certain data type from microscopic images that I have been getting increasingly uh, frequently lately. Um, and, and not lately, actually, it's, going, it's been a while that we've been working with image data. And in fact, um, um, this, this is already about a completed PhD by Tom Honor that uh, Adam and me have jointly supervised. And so I want to give you a quick introduction to the type of microscopic technologies that the images come from, that, that you see how the data is collected. Um, then um, talk about point pattern models for cellular structures that use that type of image generated. And a particular case study that has to do with microtubular formation, microtubules are important structures in cell division. And there is a link to applications in cancer because cancer, uh, an important point of cancer is uh, the, the replication, the tumor growth. So that is cell division of the tumor cells. Um, then um, I will, uh, the order is going to be a little bit different because it turns out that it would be useful to quickly do a detour and look at digital detectors because they use some of the same methods and uh, actually I have some more in, very intuitive plots that I can show you from that application. So within talking about the microscopy uh, first study, we're going to have a quick look at that. And then I'm going to turn to a second application where it's about a temporal revolution. So these, the, the data sets are then, uh, it's not videos, but it's sequences of images. Uh, well, every week videos uh, in that sense, sequence of images anyway, but um, they are the course of um, the work with those as well. Yeah, so let's talk about confocal microscopy. This goes back to Marvin Minsky, who later became famous for AI and and other algorithms and so on. Uh, so, uh, uh, so the story goes that he grew up as a son of an optician and played with the lenses in the attic and came up with a new way of doing microscopy that avoids some of the out of focus problems that traditional light, uh, light microscopy has by, um, uh, by, by playing a bit more with the lenses. Um, the, so the, the advantage of that is that, um, that you, you, uh, you have better um, focus through this pinhole, but um, the disadvantage is you need longer exposure. Um, this is being combined with fluorescent labeling. And uh, so there's a whole theory about how to do this. Uh, you use certain types of fluorescent labels that reflect certain colors. So that means you are getting a selective view of only the things that um, are labeled. 
So you're not actually seeing the whole structure of whatever you put under your microscope. You're only seeing those things that are labeled. But you can do that multiple times with multiple flu fluorescent dyes. And depending on the number of dyes you have, we are talking about traditionally two, but it can be more than two, it can be a dozen or so. You can highlight uh, the structures that you can label. Now, how to label this is a whole different area in biochemistry. You need to design for every protein or structure you want to show. You need to develop a way, a way of labeling this. And sometimes it involves several molecules, the actual fluorescent one and some antigen or whatever that tags it together. Um, so there is um, that's, a, that's a whole research direction, the labeling. But taking that for given now, we just assume we are interested in certain structures, certain molecules like proteins in a, in a cell. And we would like to, um, to see them. Uh, it's, so because we want to do that at quite high resolution, we work with these labels. We cannot uh, see everything. We can just see the things that we label. But the advantage is that we can monitor live cells. There are other techniques like electron microscopy, where you can even have much higher resolution, but the, the matter is dead. So you cannot, you cannot actually um, see a cellular process because for this technique, you have to kill the cells. Now here's an example, protein abundance, uh, where you have two dyes, green and uh, blue. The green one is visualizing something that typically is on the south surface. You can see this here on the outside. And the blue one is a stain that attaches to the nuclear. So you see things on the inside. So this, is, this has to do with, with um, localization of a tumor antigen, just as an example. Here's another example. Um, where they use three different colors. Um, one attached to the chromosomes, DNA, so that's a, a label that can attach to, to DNA. Another one attaches to a green protein. This is during cell division. So the green stuff here is in the middle, and this is the DNA of the two different cells, the new, the children's cells of the cell division. And the red stuff is here, colored in red are the microtubules. We will talk more about them in our, in our examples. This is just to show you how you have three different individual images of the same thing. And then you can on the computer put the whole thing together so you get all the three structures um, in one image. Now talk in our study, uh, we were interested in, in the collaboration with uh, Steve Royal, we'll get to that. Uh, we want to uh, look at microtubules formation. And these are structures during cell division. Here's um, the microtubules in green and the DNA, so the chromosomes here are in blue. And you can see a cell division in, uh, yeah, in eight steps, starting with one cell, um, then the rearrangements of the chromosomes and the central um, part of the work is done by the microtubules to uh, separate the chromosomes. And here you can already see how the two cells develop and in the end they are separated. So uh, we're just going to look a, a bit more closely at the cell division and the role of the microtubules now. So here is, um, here is a schematic picture of the same situation that we just had in the beautiful pictures. Um, I don't know what that's like. Uh, <laughs> so here are the chromosomes and these here in yellow, these are the microtubules. Um, and they separate the chromosomes so that each of the daughter cells gets, um, gets their own set of chromosomes. Now, this here uh, is what we take as a basis for the for the modeling we want to do. So it's not so easy to, to, to see that now as in these colored pictures, but this is what you get out of the experiment. This is being colored artificially later 
digitally. What you see when it comes out of the microscope, the data acquisition is just a grayscale image. So uh, if you know about the stuff, so the microscopist will immediately know what's going on here. So you have these little thingies uh, because that is perpendicular to the axis of the microtubules. So what you see here, the little rings are the microtubules intersection and intersection. So we see these dots here. And uh, if you, so I have um, in my version of Zoom, I have the people here uh, covering my slides. That might be a bit of a problem. Um, I can't really do anything about this. Um, Oh, I can take, no, no, I can't really remove the people here. Oh, you can move them further to the right, maybe, or to the, yeah. Um, no, they keep popping up. I don't know what to do about this. There may be a problem for everybody that, that we have the images of the participants covering some of the slides. Is that a problem for you? No, you, you can only see- Oh, I have made screen. them, I had made them smaller now, actually. Yeah, uh, yeah. so this is a view of uh, the microtubules from another direction so that we can see how they extend the length, the long, the long uh, structures here. Now, how do we model this mathematically? And that was now the moment where we thought we should try our hand on uh, using point patterns. There's a whole theory out there and a beautiful package with, I think, over 700 functions uh, that's called SPATSTAT. Uh, spatial statistics, and uh, that implements a lot of uh, this theory. So the simple one is the Poisson point process. You may all know that one that just models a, a completely spatially at random structure in the plane or higher dimensional versions of that. You certainly know the the, the one dimensional version of that, which is uh, just a Poisson process. Um, now here, I marked them yellow, and we want to now model these locations as a point pattern. So there will be some statistical distribution governing this, and uh, we don't know what distribution that is. So our collaborator, Steve Royal, um, he asked the question, so what he is really interested in is, uh, the role of a certain protein tax rate for the structure of these microtubules. So what he does is he does an experiment where he overexpresses a protein and then compares that with the control. What he believes is that there's some stuff between the microtubules, which he calls mesh, that this governs how far they are apart. So now, Mathematically, that looks like this. We have a point process and call it uh, xi0. That corresponds the realization. So this would be, a, that little x would be a data point that has been generated by a statistical model, the point process x0, capital X. And then the same thing for x by one. So that is the, um, that is the treatment, the data that corresponds to the treatment and has been realized by another point process. We don't know the distributions of these point processes and we are hoping to use the data to find out something about the differences between these two distributions. So what we did first was just a set of uh, descriptive statistic measures. So what can we all observe? We can count the dots. So that would be just the counts that we call that ND. Um, we can calculate an intensity measure. This would be then, um, so we call that mu, would be the expected um, number of points in a certain set. So uh, um, then we could for, sorry, I have a few RDs here. They're all R2 because so, images. Uh, then for some function rule, um, we, we, um, we can write this as an, as an integral. So that function that um, 
we call rho, that uh, it's the density, we call that density and probability theory that creates that intensity measure if you integrate over the space. Um, now we can renormalize this by the size of the window, and that gives me an estimate for the intensity if I count the points and then we normalize by the size of the window. Uh, another interesting concept is to do with nearest neighbors. So we want to know um, something about the neighborhood structure of the points. So we uh, just define the set of nearest neighbors of the point by NN, which, uh, which are the points that minimize the distance. This could just be one, but it could also be several ones. Then we can derive a distance distance for that, we call that NND. We can take the average of that and then arrive at the mean nearest neighbor distance. So what we're doing at the moment is we derive all sorts of measures that we can derive from data collected by images and modeled as point processes. And now there's a, a function called K function that has been developed by Brian Ripley uh, who later um, did a lot in the R world, actually. Uh, it's also called scaled neighborhood count function. So what that does is it looks at the, it, it, um, it basically looks at all the possible radii. So it starts at zero and increases. Then there is a normalization constant to do with the density. So that is just applied at the end. And then it calculates the expected value of how many points you have that are less than that radi radius apart. And that does that for each possible radius. So that you get an idea how many points you, you are going to find within a certain distance. Then how do you do that practically? You estimate that from your data because in practice, you don't have a, an expected value. You just have counts. So you need to translate all of that in the language of data points. And one important question to ask is, well, if everything was completely at random, so that would be the multivariate version of tossing a coin in one dimension. So if the points were completely at random, what would the K function look like? And it turns out it's pi times R squared. So this is just proportional to the size of a disk at that radius, which is quite logical actually. Now, if you have aggregation, then the K function um, becomes larger than that. And otherwise it becomes smaller than that. So repulsion means there's some reason why those particles, it's social distancing actually. So in, in COVID times, uh, we have a lot of the last possibility. Yeah? We are keeping a distance from each other. The points are keeping apart. And in physics, you often have that. They're also called hardcore models because the points can't, the objects can't come arbitrarily close since there's some matter, some structure, so they can't actually come close. On the other hand, clustering is very typical. Um, in crowds, certainly, it used to be very typical that people would stick together. Uh, and in the context of the microtubulus, uh, the suggestion is that there's some reason why these, uh, these microtubulus stick together in, in, uh, in fibers. Now, there is a related function that was introduced by Diggle. Uh, which now looks at all the possible points and checks if the intersection with uh, a little environment is empty or not. And then it sums that up. You can also interpret it as a probability, actually, the indicator functions, the expected value of the indicator functions. So this is an alternative way. It's the distribution of 
distance of randomly selected point to its nearest neighbor. So this is a little bit different from the K function. So they are doing quite similar things, but there is a subtle difference in this is, this is more nearest neighbor oriented, while the K function is more oriented towards just counting a number of points, numbers of points in neighborhoods. Now, how to estimate that? Again, you need to convert the whole formula into counts. Uh, then you can calculate that for your data. And you can again ask, well, if everything is completely at random, especially completely at random, what would it look like? And the formula is one minus e to the power minus intensity times pi r squared. So again, there is, of course, something proportional to the size of a disk in there. Now, I said we're going to do a little detour, and the moment to do that is now. We're going to now completely jump to a different application, but we will come back to the cells uh, and, and the cell division and the microscopy after we did that little um, excursion. Uh, so this is about X-rays. Uh, image images because they use um, digital detectors and those digital detectors uh, are created out of pixels and the pixels can die. So when we worked with uh, images created by um, X-ray tomography actually, uh, we discovered in some data we got from our collaborators at uh, uh, Warwick Manufacturing Unit um, and their fancy Nikon machines. So um, despite uh, these being real guard machines, they still had a lot of problems with the data quality. And then we looked at this more closely and we found weird structures. So in these detectors, there were all these lines and turned out there were all dead pixels, these lines. So we built we, we interpreted that as a spatial point process. And then we applied the K function and the G function, and that gave us those kinds of images. So what you can see here is that very small distances, you have a lot of clustering. The K function explodes just next to zero. This is simply because of these lines. Uh, and here is, So here is the uh, pi r squared. So if it was completely spatially at random, you would get that, that um, dashed red line for the k function. Instead, we get this explosion. But then at larger distances, all is fine because the, the, the dead pixels turned out to be spatially at random, ex except for some issues like the lines and also in the corners. There was more stress on the object in the corners and that created those problems. Now, this is um, another example, another, another image where on top of those lines, it had an area where it was a lot of accumulation of points. There was something broken and another one here. Uh, so you can, this, this never came back to normality. This just took off. Um, in this, so what we then did artificially, we removed this area from the, and we, we, we just only counted one dot for every line, just to test how the K function captures that. And it turns out when you remove those problems, then the K function looks quite normal. So it's more or less spatially at random. There are always some issues at larger distances because it's a finitely large picture. So you can't expect this to behave normally once, once it becomes bigger, but there are some, some edge correction techniques as well, which, which we use later. But this is just for illustration so that you see what this is doing. Similarly for the G function, the G function here explodes because of even more than the K function because of all those nearest neighbors. And if we remove that, we get normal behavior. So um, if we don't count them. Yeah, so this is a different project. Partly, uh, we actually linked up with um, people in Manchester from the Henry Moseley facility, image facility, because they uh, gave us some data and, and we, um, we had some discussions about um, the applications of that. And uh, we wrote a web app in the paper about this kind of work. You can check that out. You're welcome to do that. Information is here. 
Um, but this was mostly for illustration because we now come back to Steve Royal and his um, microscopic images. And our question again is, how uh, are these um, patterns influenced through overexpression of tax 3 that protein versus control? So we now developed some test statistics that simply looked at differences between these various measures that we developed before for the largely descriptive statistics of, um, of the patterns. So this would be, for example, the window size, the um, number of um, the number of points, the intensity. Um, then we can look at the nearest neighbor statistics, compare these between the two uh, different types of images, the treatment and the control. We can look at the minimum spanning tree. Um, we can look at the difference between the G functions. We also have weights in here. I didn't address that yet. The weights intuitively just have to do with um, how many dots are in the picture altogether. And we looked at those um, statistics where we weight and statistics where we ignore that. Uh, then, uh, so how do we get the null hypothesis? Uh, since we don't know the distributions, what we did were resampling based uh, techniques. So we used our permutation tests. Uh, this requires exchangeability under the null, which is not exactly the same as independence, but a softer version of that, which is often used in statistics. Um, so you need to define under a certain set of operations and then assume that your distribution is exchangeability under the null. Um, yeah, and then we, we, we just calculated various of those statistics to see um, what we get in the um, in the in our application, but we also ran a few simulation studies. Here are homogeneous intensity Poisson processes, but you can also use an inhomogeneous Poisson process. That means it's still spatially at random, but you introduce uh, an intensity. And maybe a quick remark about that: there is an immortal identifiability problem usually because sometimes you don't know in a given data set that where you have some uh, aggregation of points, is that because of dependency or is that because of an inhomogeneous um, density? So uh, if you work with your processes, keep in mind that you cannot always separate that unless you have maybe a very large data, enough data to separate it, or you have some biological information where you know which is the right model. So you can, if possible, you can use contextual knowledge to clarify that. Um, now, what did you get, did we get? Um, if you look at some of these patterns, this is just some examples. You cannot necessarily tell the difference by eye. And that was the motivation, I guess, for the biologists to, to, to contact us because they often, if whenever possible, of course they, they if, uh, I think Rutherford that said that you know if, if if you need statistics to evaluate your experiments, you have done the, the wrong experiment. This is a bit outdated because today I think we are looking for so subtle differences that it makes use to use statistics and biologists really want to use statistics. Um, but uh, it means that they cannot always eyeball what is the result of the experiment. They really need to quantify matters and uh, come up with test statistics. So in Steve's um, data, what we found between control and treatment, even though you couldn't see anything by eye, looking at our statistics evaluated on his data, there were significant differences. So if you compare control and treatment, you see that all the means or medians generated um, by the treatment condition were bigger. Um, specifically, here's a number of points, the observation window area and the estimated density. So that indicates that in the microtubules, 
uh, that the microtubules are arranged are arranged in some kind of fibers. They're called K fibers, uh, and this can really be pinned down in this quantification. Uh, this is the um, mean nearest neighbor distance. So you can see they're densely packed in the treatment condition compared to the control. Uh, the weighing makes a bit of a difference, but you, you see it either way, with and without the weighing, you see these differences. Minimum spanning tree as well. Um, so this is just the, the dual view of the more tightly clustering through the uh, nearest neighbors. So you see that the, the minimum spanning tree is smaller because they're closer together. So the, here is um, the K function and the G function. Uh, you can see in this situation that um, it again indicates this, um, this behavior that they come together in clusters. Now, here's just an example of the kind of formal tests we did with the various statistics that I showed before. Uh, one other comment is, of course, if we create a lot of different statistics, we, sh we need to worry about multiple testing. Uh, so here are the p-values, uh, they are very small, so it's not, not a concern, but uh, in general, you have, to, you have to consider that if you keep searching for differences in, in a dozen different way of measuring differences, you are going to find differences eventually if you just keep looking for it simply by chance. So whenever you are a test, you're using a lot of these different statistics, they're all great, they're all capturing different elements of it, but there is a risk of basically forcing a result, even though there is no difference, simply by, 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 that, um, by that excessive testing. So instead what you do and uh, you, you just adjust, for multiple testing, that, that means you need to pass a higher threshold for the p-values. And the simplest way to do that is response only. That's not always the best way, but it was good enough in this situation. There's a whole uh, theory for all sorts of different adjustments that take into account correlation between the hypothesis and so on. So you can dig into that further if you have to. And um, yeah, this is just a summary of, of, of what I already said along the way that uh, we could see from data analysis that the tax three overexpression is associated with an impact on this stuff that is between the microtubules and somehow regulates how far they are apart. Uh, I want to tie that back a little bit to what kind of questions we ask. Um, and that is, we really wanted to know something um, about um, the role of this, this tax rate. So we cannot, from just statistical measures, say what this thing is doing. But what we can say is we can measure differences. We can say where it is located and how that location is, um, is influenced by overexpression. And then the biologists come back in and can draw their control their interpretation of that in the context. Now, um, for the second study, I just want to um, basically give you a broad idea of what we did and what we used, but not go through a lot of details because I want to leave some time for, um, for questions as well. But this is using some other tools and um, it is quite interesting process of how to formulate the questions and be realistic about what data can do in that context. So the question in this, um, in this example was about the whole process of cell division and the role that another protein, EB3, uh, and the protein we already looked at, it, at the tax tree, that role, what is the role of these proteins over time? So now we are talking about a video rather than just individual images. And we want to know, is there a relationship between these, micros, uh, with, between these proteins um, 
are they both part of the same standard of process? Um, where do they localize? We know that the EB3 localizes at the tip of the growing microtubules during mitosis. But what about the other one? Is the tax free there as well? Is it there? The idea, the idea being that if they're in the same location consistently, they probably collaborate in some way. This is not a proof, but it is um, what you can get from the data. So it is some evidence towards the fact that they will interact in a chemical way, or at least that they are part of the same network. Um, so the notion of presence in the same location for a biochemist is evidence for um, biochemical interaction. So we have, again, a data set with fluorescent microscopy images collect at, uh, co collected in seven samples at a total number of, of around 50 type points. Um, and this is live cell imaging of mitosis. Of course, how to take those images, how to coordinate the cells to all be in the right you know, cell division timing and so on. That's a whole other talk. That's what uh, the scientists are doing. Now, what can we answer? Um, we can we can answer the question is the protein tax free present in the same locations as the protein EB3 during the process of mitosis cell division. Um, in other words, we are asking about a bulk movement and dependency between bulk movement patterns. So we have two proteins and we can image the bulk movement of each of them separately. And then we can ask, can we, com we can compare the evolution over time. We can measure if they're close to each other in some way. So that has been, can be done in all sorts of situations. So for example, you may want to look at air particles and pollution, different types of air particles, are they always in the same location over time? What about animal movements, you know, predator, prey or so? Um, and various other cellular structures. So uh, those types of questions have been asked before. Here is um, <clears throat> um, one tool that you can use in this context. It's called colocalization for proteins. So there are a number of different measures. Uh, there's, for example, Mander's di distance, uh, Mander's coefficient, um, but that has mathematically not very good properties. Most typically, uh, it's just correlation that is being used. Um, so here you see an example of two different proteins, the red. One is dyed in red, the other one in green, and here they are overlaid and they look like they are often in the same location. So you can just use um, correlation for that. Though this is still an ongoing research area and just in the last five years, there have been a few new papers on that because the correlation is more primitive than it should be. It completely ignores the spatial structure, even though it wants to assess something that is actually spatial uh, but it doesn't really look at the neighborhood structure. So it's to calculate the correlation, they just use the points, the, the pixels of the images like a list, rather than considering the spatial, the, the spatial structure. So I think there is more work to do and is, is being done by several teams at the moment. Here are some examples for um, simulated images, densities of two proteins and what the correlation gives you if you calculate that. But this is uh, something we can do in every time point for the proteins we're interested in. So we did a bit of that. Um, we, we created an artificial version of this tax tree by doing a vertical reflection. And then we compared all the pairs. So the vertical reflection is meant to be completely different or only co coincidentally similar to the, to the original tax tree. Um, and then this is our other protein. And we see that uh, the co-localization between EB3 and TAX3 is always higher than any of the other combinations. So that is some evidence that they are linked to each other. But this sort of first quick and dirty analysis, that 
doesn't actually address the trajectories because it only looks at individual time points. And so here's a, uh, the, we want to have a model that captures evolution over time. So we thought we look at the Earth movers distance, also known as Kantorovich Wasserstein metric. It comes from um, modeling of transportation costs, I think. Um, Originally, um, it was developed in Russia in, in the sector of logistics. And this is a way, so it's also called Earth, Earth Movers Distance. It's, it's lately been used a lot in machine learning. And what it does is it looks at flows that minimize the overall costs of moving some stuff from one location in another. And then it normalizes that by the total flow. So roughly, intuitively speaking, under a certain set of boundary conditions, you calculate how much work is it to move some stuff somewhere else. So if you're talking about the proteins, you want to know how similar they are by quantifying how much it would be to, move, to convert one into the other. So we use that. And I think I want to probably come to a close so we can have a discussion, but show you just a little bit of a program an overview of a program we did involving the Earth Movers Distance to address that bulk movement question that we had about the two proteins. So in, in theory, the theory, the probability theory of that is all very developed and beautiful because uh, measure theory has done that for us. But to actually do that with data turned out to be a bit more work because we needed to do discretization in different directions. Since in, in data, you need to computationally deal with it. So we couldn't have a continuous spec in the other directions. That would have been too difficult to deal with. We also needed to worry about subregions. Um, so we, because if we had done everything at once in the whole area, uh, due to larger spaces returning unintuitive, um, geometry, we need to localize the problem. So we calculated, and also for computational reasons, actually. So we calculated things locally and then patchwork that together. And then we also had to do a permutation test study again, because we didn't know the true distributions of the null hypothesis. Um, and uh, here is some examples of, of hypothesis. So null hypothesis would be between sample independence of those local, local bulk movement patterns. So that would mean that the two proteins have nothing to do with each other over time. Um, to create the null hypothesis, we needed to have certain operations that describe movements. So we specified rotation, reflection, reordering, and so on. And uh, then uh, another notion is within sample independence of local valve movement patterns. So what about one protein by itself? Is that independent or dependent? So here are some simulations of those spatial patterns, um, just noise, isotropic, homogeneous, and symmetric. Um, and this is just a, roughly uh, a summary of, of what we found in our simulations that for independent move, movement, we um, found that this mostly confirms uh, the theoretical methods, but we did have some problems with the, with the composition of hypotheses. And for dependent movement, we are struggling a bit with a, with a high rate of incorrect rejections. So there's probably something we can improve, um, but we have, evidence for validity um, for an omnibus hypothesis approach. So that means uh, the hypothesis joined together as a, as a set. Um, applied to Steve's data, um, we could see that uh, we had a consistent rejection of um, the neural hypothesis. So that means there is some spatial collateralization over time uh, during the evolution of the of the bug movements in these uh, um, in this biological process, so 
from a biological point of view, there is evidence that the, the movement patterns of these two proteins are dependent, which for a biologist means they are probably involved in the same uh, process. And so furthermore, they think that this has something to do with the localization in the tips of these growing microtubules, but that takes into account that we already know that for the EV3. So that is um, joint work, as I said, with Tom and um, Adam. And uh, we have a few technical, uh, technical reports and a publication with Steve on that. And now maybe should I uh, probably stop the slideshow and try to see people again. Yes, thanks a lot, <clears throat> Julia, for your talk. Um, are there any questions? Oh, there. Are, now I see the people again. Some people are there <laughs> with names, and some people are there. Is, for example, a squirrel was in this talk. Yeah, some this people have really creative avatars. <laughs> um, so if you have a question, you can either ask a question in the chat or you can unmute yourself and. Um, ask a question. Uh, Gabriella might have a question, actually. Yeah, I have one question, and that is, um, you said, Julia, that um, if I understand correctly, then to analyze the movement is difficult because there are lots of challenges. Is it because you need to analyze the movement of many particles or subjects moving around? Or would it be also the problem if there is just one of them to analyze? Ah, okay. So if you had just one, uh, you mean like a bigger object? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's... I probably wouldn't work with the point process then. Uh, I would probably... I, are you interested? in the location of that one object as well? Or is it more about the evolution over time or both? I'm more about evolution over time, how the character of the movement of that object is changing over time. Yeah, I think, I think you could probably do something similar, but a little simpler than the, the Kantorovich Vassistan method. Mm -hmm. I think you could probably use some other um, a distance between functions. Uh, maybe there would be issues with normalization, I could imagine. Um, depending on if you if you have two things that you compare and maybe one is tends to have higher variation or, or in general or, or or a huge magnitude. Yeah, so it will depend a bit on, on the details there, but I would probably do something um with this with a different metric um but you may have some of the other issues as well like the problem we had with uh with local versus global view of the motion because what you could have is something that goes in a loop how do you deal with a loop so you need to have an idea whether you care only about where it comes out in the end or whether you actually care about the distance it it travels um so if you have a trajectory view then it would do that but you may have to put it together from little localized pieces in your depending on how the data are given and so on so, so that requires some thought i think and then the other question is, what is your null hypothesis? How do you generate uh, your null distribution? How do you generate your null distribution? Parametric or non-parametric, depending on how much you know from the context. Is there anyone, so uh, if there's no other question, maybe I can ask you the questions. Uh, uh, is anyone working with image data and what kind of image data are you working with? Do you work with? Okay, so I work with retinal imaging data, but I also work with football 
video data. So the question I asked you was about how players of the football move on the pitch. <laughs> so there are some colleagues of mine that have worked on that. Um, one PhD student worked on that. Not, not my PhD, sorry, a colleague's PhD student. So if you want to know more about that, I can put you in touch with people. Uh, they have used video data for a strategy. Yeah. Well, yeah, you're in Liverpool, of course, you must be yes, looking at so football. I, I like your coach. I think um, I'm a bit biased on that, but I really do like him. Normally, I don't really care about football at all. And couldn't care less about German football coaches, but I do like this particular one. Um, he's quite unusual, I think. 